Hi everyone, this is Dr. Lagos, and today I'm going to be talking to you about Nikos Kazantzakis, one of the most famous, if not the most famous uh, Greek writers in, the contem in contemporary Greek literature. This is an individual who is extremely prolific in his writings, had an international following, and was also quite controversial. So who is Nikos Kazantzakis? Where is he from? Kazantzakis was born in, um, on March 3rd, 1883, on the island of Crete, in the town of Iraklion. He is a uh, father, was Michalis uh, Kazantzakis, and he was a dealer in agricultural products and wine, kind of like a middle class type of family. And um, it's interesting because his father is actually going to serve, and we'll see his image here on the left, as the model for one of his initial works called Capitan Michalis. So uh, his father proved to be a formative figure in his life. Here on the right, you're going to see an artistic rendition of what the family home uh, looked like at the time. So what do we know about Kazantzakis and his upbringing? Uh, he was born during a very turbulent period in Cretan history. As you may have remembered from previous lectures, I discussed the uprising and attempts for unification for the island to the Greek state. So a lot of progress had been made. So we're starting in 1868. We have the Pact of Halepa, uh, the organic statute. And by the late 1880s we uh, and 90s, we start to see a lot of movement, not uprisings, violence on the island. And this is going to affect the Kasantzakis family. In 1889, um, during a period of increased turbulence, uh, the family is actually going to go to Athens for a little bit, just kind of avoid the conflict on the island. And they're also going to come back, and Kazantzakis is going to be enrolled in a local primary school where he's going to get some of his education. And um, he's also uh, another period of... Um, what do you say? Uprisings happen again. And this is going to be in 1897, 1898. And the family is actually going to go to the island of Naxos. And there, Kazantzakis is going to complete his secondary education. And he's going to do it at a French uh, Catholic school. It's run by some monks. And it's interesting because there it is cited that Kazantzakis fell in love with the French language. Now, Kazantzakis is going to be very linguistically adept. He's going to be able to do translations later on in his life. So he's really, really good with languages. So we could see this early on in his um, love for the French language and learning it and really having a mastery of the language. So Kassanzaikis uh, begins to have a very broad education. In 1902, he's going to be enrolled. He's going to study law at the University of Athens. And at the time, as he's uh, at the school, he's actually going to begin writing some works. He's going to publish an essay called The Sickness of the Century and his first novel, Serpent and Lily. So in 1907, one of his works is going to read, is going to receive a dramatic prize called Day is Breaking. And all of a sudden, Cousin Zykes becomes extremely well known. He begins a journalistic career, and then in October of 1907, he begins graduate studies in Paris. And there he gets engaged with other journalistic activities and serious literature. And he's also going to start attending lectures by a very prominent philosopher, physician, a theorist. I mean, he just does everything. A man by the name of Henri Bergson. And what is so important about Bergson is that he's going to have an incredible amount of influence on Kazantzakis, especially in the realm of religion and understanding man's role and relationship to God. This whole, he challenges ideas of um, fate and destiny. Oftentimes we would say, yes, something is meant to be. And Bergson challenges it and says that we have freedom for choice. We have freedom. We don't have to go to a preordained destiny. So Kazantzakis is going to hear this. He's also going to read a lot about Nietzsche, Frederick Nietzsche. And he's actually going to write his thesis on Nietzsche. So he is so 
consumed and absorbed by Nietzsche and philosophical thought in general, but he's going to focus on it. He is also during the period that he's attending these lectures, writing his thesis, he's going to complete another novel called Broken Souls. So in 1909, he finishes his dissertation on Nietzsche and then writes a play called The Master Builder. He's going to return back to Crete and then he's going to get involved in um, some of the local Greek type of um, issues and affairs. So there are two things that I really I, I kind of want to emphasize is that when he goes back to Crete, he gets connected with a kind of literary uh, community on the island. And he, he becomes president of something called the Solomos Society of Iraklion. Now, the Solomos Society is a strong advocate for the use of demotic Greek. Notice, this is a period, the 1910s, even 1920s, of heightened tensions over the issue of language. We talked about the language controversy before and the polemics between Katharevusa and Demotic. And, and Kazantzakis solidly takes the position of Demotic. And this is going to be characteristic of his writings throughout his career. It influences the type of words he uses and the phrases and everything. We're going to get to that. And he really much did not want to use Katharevusa. He's also part of this growing sentiment that you kind of had to abandon um, the Greeks needed to abandon their dependence on ancient Greece and antiquity in general to forge a brand new path. So the whole notion of progonoplexia, kind of like ancestoritis, the burden of ancestors, uh, ancient Greek ancestors, he just wants to kind of chuck to the past and said, demotic and the future is the way to go. So he's also uh, very much connected with his circle individuals like Ion Dragumis, and he writes an essay for our youth, again, in Demotic, and insists in this essay that Greece really needs to move forward in a brand new direction and to new glory. Um, the other factor I do want to emphasize, besides Kazantzakis' the devotion to d the Demotic language, is also his stirrings in, the, in nationalism, the Megali Idea, the expansion of the Greek state. So, for him being born in this very kind of volatile situation on the island of Crete kind of conditions him initially. This is going to last up until about 1920, 1922, when we're going to see a major shift in his outlook. But for the time being that right now, he's going to be very much in favor of the expansion of the Greek state and Greek nationalism. It is also during this time in 1910, he, married, he meets a young woman, Galatia Alexiou, and he marries her in 1911. Both of these individuals are very literary, and uh, Galatia is very literate. She's a writer. Both Nikos Kazantzakis and Galatia Alexiou are very left-leaning. So politically speaking, although they were proponents of the Megali idea, they were far more liberal in their politics. So um, they lived together for a year and then they decided to get married in 1911. And um, in order to support his wife and himself, both individuals are writing and he will translate so many different novels. He begins translating works from French, German, English, even ancient Greek in order to make some money to survive. So um, in 1912, he begins, he's been digesting uh, Bergson's ideology and his ideas specifically about man and Christianity, man and relation and Jesus Christ. And he begins to kind of discuss this in, um, in the Greek uh, uh, intellectual circles. And he begins to give lectures on the topic. Um, when the first Balkan War broke out in October 1912, he volunteers. And he actually manages to be in Eleftherios Venizelos' office. So he gets kind of like a cushy position. He doesn't see as much activity on um, the battlefront as others. So he's, he's quite different than our previous generation a writer, the generation of the 1930s, where they did participate in active combat. So Kazantzaki sees it, but doesn't have the direct connection that some of our other writers had had. So um, after the end of the Balkan Wars in 1914, 
Kazantzakis and another very famous writer, a man by the name of Angelos Sicilianos, decide to go to one of the most revered and sacred areas of Orthodox Christianity, and that is Mount Athos. So Mount Athos is near Thessaloniki. It's one of the three fingers. It is a third finger over, and it is a monastic community that was created during Byzantine times and has its own separate legal oversight. It remains frozen in time, and only men can visit there. Women cannot. So it's seen as kind of like a, like a hub of orthodoxy, kind of like a Mecca, so to speak, a religious center for Orthodox Christianity. And so he goes there and they would stay for 40 days and they would visit uh, various monasteries. They would read um, different works. They would read the gospels. They also read Dante and they would even read works from Buddha. So he was very open in his religious reading. So it's not just focusing alone on orthodoxy, but just kind of exploring religious belief and theology in general in a very wide basis. And this is going to condition, it's going to really influence the way he's going to look at Christianity and the role of Jesus Christ. And he's going to be addressing this conflict and his, his um, invest, not investigations, but kind of like his pursuit of understanding a little bit more later on. Christ recrucified and the last temptation of Christ are the prime examples of his grappling with uh, theology and, or, and Christianity. So he um, comes back to Greece. He's going to be writing a little bit more. And um, he in 1917, this is a really interesting kind of um, uh, story, is that He's going to get involved uh, because it is during the period of World War I. He uh, tries to mine lignite in the Peloponnese. And this experience of trying to mine, trying to get these uh, minerals and natural resources to help with war production, together with an idea he had in 1915 for harvesting wood, is going to form a really strong portion of uh, the movie Zorba the Greek, and uh, we don't read it in our excerpt, but Life and Times of Alexi Zorba. So while you're all going to see it in the movie, it figured very prominently in the work as well. So uh, it's interesting that these type of experiences, the personal experiences, even as fathers, form very strong, are, are very strongly prominent in his written works. So he ends up, he doesn't really participate in World War I. He goes back in 1918 to Switzerland, and um, he is married with Galatia Alexiou begins to waver. And he had said in his journals that while they were very similar in their outlook, their souls did not connect. At the end of World War I, uh, Kazantzakis is going to come back to Greece. And uh, uh, Venizelos appoints him the director general of the Ministry of Welfare. And his task was to help repatriate 150,000 Greeks who are being persecuted by the Bolshev Bolsheviks in the Caucasus. Uh, Kazantzakis goes in July and he travels to Versailles during the Paris Peace Conference, a report on that. And he also participates in the negotiations for the end of World War I. He then, after the Paris Peace Conference, he goes to Macedon, the Macedonian lands and Thrace to, to make sure that these refugees find somewhere to live. So he kind of helps in their transition. And um, these experience of helping these refugees are actually going to show up in his book, Christ Recrucified. So uh, he participates in this and he sees what happens and what uh, Venizelos is trying to achieve for the Greek state. But this whole dream is going to come to a crashing halt in 1922. But for Kazantzakis, he's going to become very dispirit, disheartened in 1920 when Venizelos loses the elections. And then a little bit earlier, um, Ion Dragumis, whom he was close to, was assassinated. So his, he was very broken and um, he resigns from the Ministry of Welfare in November following Venizelos' defeat and he goes to Paris 
Paris, France. Following that, he's going to spend a year or so uh, touring Germany, and and, and Kazantzakis is going to be touring a lot. He's one of the most traveled writers that we will uh, engage with throughout the semester, and he goes throughout all of Europe. He goes to parts of Africa. He goes to Asia. One of his last trips is actually going to be to China and Japan. He's going to be invited to China. I'll get to that in a little bit. So he comes back to Greece in February 1921. And he tries to, you know, make some money and he begins uh, writing uh, textbooks. He does uh, translations. And um, then when the Asia Minor catastrophe happens, he basically leaves. He, he goes to Berlin where he hears about the final collapse and the catastrophe itself. And he's going to stay there for a while. And here in 1922, we're going to see the final shift in his kind of political outlook. So beginning in 1920, when Venizelos loses the elections, we see a little arc. You see his interaction with refugees. By 1922, he espouses the ideas of communism, and he's going to try to form communist cells. So little organization networks. And this is going to get him into a lot of hot water. It's going to get him into hot water in Greece, and um, it's going to get him into hot water in other areas. He's going to remain a very strong socialist, and he's going to feel that uh, socialism is the way to go to support and to encourage the rights of the people. So what is best for the majority of the population. So um, he's going to be traveling around. And in 1924, um, that's another pivotal year he is going to meet uh, somebody who he's going to fall in love with. So at the time that he is not falling out of love with Galactea, in 1924, he's going to meet the love of his life, Eleni Samio. And um, what he meets her, and he begins divorce proceedings with Galatea. Their divorce is going to be finalized in 1926. And one of the conditions of the divorce that Galatea emphasized, and she did, was able to get, is that she keeps the last name Kazantzakis. So for the rest of her life, even though she remarried someone else, she kept Galatea Kazantzakis and continued publishing under that name. So he's going to fall in love uh, with Eleni Samil, and they're going to be a couple. They don't marry until 1945, the end of um, World War II. And this is in the midst of the Civil War. So uh, he's going to be getting involved in political affairs. And there's an article uh, by Istrati that is published in the journal Le Monde, in Le Monde that introduces uh, Kazantzakis to the European audience. Now, what else is going on in this le in this article that kind of he's writing about is they had this um, they had a a play that um, in Alhambra theater praising the Soviet experiment, and so highlighting the glories of the Soviet Union and how wonderful communism is led to absolute riots and demonstrations in the street. And um, Kazantzakis and another Greek, Dimitris Vilinos, a well-known writer, uh, who organized this event, um, are threatened with legal action. Istrati himself is actually, uh, was threatened with deportation to get out of the country. He's half Romanian, so they wanted to deport him back to uh, Romania. And uh, so April 1928, Kazantzakis actually goes to Russia. So he goes to the Soviet Union, and um, he tries to get involved in, in putting together kind of like a film on the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution. And um, so they go through there and meet various individuals. So um, from this point on, so he's going to be coming back. He's going to um, come back for World War II. And uh, here we're going to see how his writings um, his writings are really going to reflect the times. So he's going to come back to Greece from 1933 to 1944. And then after that, during the midst of the Civil War, he is not going to participate because many of our other writers were very sympathetic, if not members of the Communist Party. He's actually going to go abroad. He's going to live 
in uh, France. So let me show you. This is the original house in Egina, where he lives with <clears throat> Eleni. And then in 1946, they're going to live in Cap d'Antibes in France. Uh, and that's going to be really his base. Uh, so let's get now to some of his works. So Kazan Zaikis is an individual who is extremely well read. He was a philosopher in the sense of his religious beliefs. And this is where he is extraordinarily controversial. And some of the debates uh, that circle around him is that he was not a devout Christian, that he rejected the principles and the dogma of the Orthodox Church, and his writings have been attacked by religious leaders. Um, in 1955, uh, his work was banned by the Greek, by the Roman Catholic Church. I'll see that. In 1954, um, the Pope decided to uh, ban The Last Temptation of Christ and placed it on the Index of Forbidden Books. The Greek Orthodox Church, there was a big push after this work was published to uh, excommunicate him. And he wouldn't be the first one to be excommunicated by the Greek Orthodox Church, but it never really was finalized. So this has been the sense up until recently that he was really rejecting uh, both the Catholic and Orthodox understandings of religion and the role of Jesus Christ. Most recently, others have said he really was devout and was just challenging and thinking and uh, trying to project a new worldview. So whether you believe that really he rejected it or rather he was still struggling with these concepts and trying to figure out his own type of ideas, I'll leave it all to you. The one thing though that is interesting, he has a very famous quote when uh, the Pope decided to take off the last temptation of Greek uh, the Last Temptation of Christ as an accepted book. And it said, you gave me a curse, Holy Fathers. I give you a blessing. May your conscience be as clear as mine and may you be as moral and religious as I. So very interesting. So now let's get to some of his works because uh, Gassan Zaikis has published extensively. And um, I'll tell you, he has published 13 novels, eight plays, he has uh, had memoirs, essays, travel books, so much that he has published. So let's get to some of the leading works. Serpent and Lily, one of his earliest writings as a young individual. The Saviors of God, Spiritual Exercise in 1927. The Odyssey, which is the longest poem in existence, 33,000. 333 lines in 17 syllables each. So it is the modern version of the Odyssey with a kind of a different focus where we see um, Odysseus going to the equator trying to find, you know, kind of like Atlantis, like this new, like incredible area. So the Odyssey is one of the most well-known works and uh, very interesting. Then you get to the work that we're going to be studying this week, Zorba the Greek, or The Life and Times of Alexis Zorba, uh, which was published in 1946. Uh, then we have Christ Recrucified, 1948, Freedom or Death, 1950, uh, The Last Temptation of Christ in 1951, which caused the most incredible furor uh, amongst religious uh, leadership. And because it had Christ and the whole notion of him being crucified um, kind of reinterpreted what was the role of that. And then you see what would happen. The temptation is he's, Christ is on the cross to see what his life would have been had he not been crucified. So that was kind of like unacceptable to the, to the churches. And um, so that's what caused his this book to be taken off by the Roman Catholic Church. And then you have another religious work, God's Pauper, St. Francis of Assisi, which he's very kind of personally kind of identified with. And then his um, report to Greco. And the one thing I do want to say is that uh, Kazan Zaikis was repeatedly um, nominated for awards. And even 
and he came up against Albert Camus and he lost the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Prize in Literature by only two votes. And Camus said that Kazantzaki should have gotten it. But either way, Albert Camus, phenomenal work, really groundbreaking for Kazantzaki's, is in very good company. So he was definitely um, part of um, the literati. He was very much considered one of the best of his time. And he actually got an International Peace Prize. So he was, um, you know, he was honored in that way. So let's now go to some of the influences on his work. So he was obviously influenced by Friedrich Nietzsche, whom he wrote his uh, dissertation on, uh, Henri Bergson, and then others such as Fyodor Dostoevsky, uh, Lenin from the Soviet Union, uh, Buddha, also Angelo Sicilianos, another well-known writer we didn't get a chance to read this semester, and um, also an average everyday person, a workman who was part of this lignite mine, a man by the name of George Zorbas. And that name, I think, might sound familiar. So he has a very romanticized worldview with the emphasis on the uniqueness of the person and how life is really open. You really can write your own destiny. It's not a foredained conclusion. So there are infinite possibilities of life. And so he doesn't quite follow the accepted path of Christianity that someone in Greece or in Italy or elsewhere in the Catholic or the Orthodox world would be following. So instead, he fills it with other more philosophical approaches. So what are some of the key themes in Kazantzakis' novels? Heroism, a little bit of nationalism, irrationalism, exotic, exoticism and escapism, and spirituality. So I'll get to these themes a little bit more once we come to Zorba the, the Greek because they figure prominently. But just to know that nationalism, this idea, is something that came from his early upbringing. So up until 1920, these ideas of the Megali Idea of the nation, its growth and its glory, is really, it remains part of um, the legacy in, in Kazantzakis and we see it in his work. Irrationalism. So things don't always have to be rational, why people do things. And you're going to see this in Zorba the Great, the Greek. Why do I say Zorba the Great? And exoticism and escapism, people leaving one area to go to somewhere else. And then the whole notion of spirituality, what does it really mean? So Let's now look at some of Kazantzakis' language. He uses a lot of adjectives. There's a lot of emotional exaggeration, shifts in tone that are incongruous, but there are beautiful and rich metaphors. So um, there is also rhetorical poetry and some influences by an Italian nationalist, Gabriele D'Annunzio, who figured very prominently in the Italian unification, Italian nationalist movement. Um, so we see some of this language and uh, these words kind of being incorporated in Kazantzakis, but overall within the context of demotic, that's where Kazantzakis stood. So let's now uh, look specifically at Zorba the Greek. So I have it over here. Um, I have it in the English, Zorba the Greek, and I also have it here, Vios que politia tu Alexi Zorba. Um, so Life and Times of Alexi Zorba. Uh, so it is a very successful novel, like the others written by Cousin Zykes. Even though he really wasn't so crazy about novels, he actually liked poetry a little bit more. And it's set in a small rural community, and it kind of goes back to Nikos Politis in the terms of like this organic type of rural village background. And it's also on the island uh, of his upbringing. Uh, it's brimming, it's absolutely full of philosophical ideas, elements from different areas kind of brought together and brought in since antiquity. So it can also be seen, and let me give you some of these themes here, whenever the whole phrase, the life and times of, that is usually used in Byzantine times when writing about a saint, the life and times of Saint so-and-so. 
So the life and times of Alexei Zorba is trying to cast an average individual in this format of writing about a saint, ideography. So it's a very kind of interesting juxtaposition. And um, instead, it, he also brings in a little bit of Plato because in Plato's Republic, the whole, the beginning of this starts with, I went down yesterday to Piraeus. For Alexis Zorba, Zorba the Greek, it begins with, I first met him in Piraeus. I had gone to the harbor. So both capturing from ancient Greek type of references and also religious references are being kind of brought in. So what is the point of bringing these in? It is to show that Zorba is a modern day kind of secular saint. So uncoupling him from the religious aspect, he is just an, a saint in modern day without any religious um, affiliation. And you see that when you see the movie, his distance from uh, the clerics and the priests and the institution, he kind of makes fun of them a little bit and he, he kind of teases and makes fun of a lot of different institutions and um, people. So um, the character of Alexis Zorba is based on George Zorbas, who is a friend of Kazantzakis, and together they'd open this lignite mine in the Peloponnese. And so Zorba becomes larger than life. He is a man of action. And this kind of brings about a little bit of fascism because it, it comes from um, a philosophical type of uh, belief at the time that was kind of tied into fascism. And he actually, believe it or not, had interviewed Benito Mussolini. Uh, so he knew that and it's, it kind of highlighted he is this man of action. Um, he is also a peasant with wisdom and vitality. So it goes against these very literate individuals. He can be primitive, brutal, raw. Somebody also could be sensitive, irrational, and based on spontaneity. In contrast, you're gonna have the narrator, the boss, we don't really give his name, who is timid, quiet, introverted, a man of letters and of intellectual preoccupation. So Alexis Zorba and Zorba the Greek, it's kind of like the yin and yang, and absolutely, uh, Cousin Zykes knew about this. And they work together, Zorba, the emotion, boss, the intellect, larger than life, timid, they work together. And what is the whole purpose of life? What is the goal? And the very end tells you, even though their big dream is not going to go as planned, how does Zorba understand it at the very end? To finish off now with his biography, um, so Kazantzakis is going to um, he is going to have, like, he'll have some ailments. He had a little bit of facial eczema. He had um, an infection in his right eye. They say basically he lost the use of his right eye. And then in the end, 1956 to 1957, he was sick. He was very sick. And he actually had leukemia. And at the time, he gets invited to go on a tour of China. He's going to go to Japan. Here we have a photo of China. And he's going to go on the river and um, see everything. And he's going to get terribly sick, very, very sick. Uh, he's going to have um, a vaccine that's going to give him gangrene in his arm. And he's going to get treated with that. Then he's going to fly to Copenhagen. And then he's going to come to Germany uh, where he uh, in Freiburg, in Breslau, uh, where he's going to be treated. And he's going to die October 26, 1957. So the illnesses are basically going to consume him and his leukemia. And from there, his body is going to be taken to Athens, where he's going to be given um, kind of like the state funeral. And then it's going to be brought to the island of Crete, Iraklion. Now, the final thing I'll say about Kazantzakis is that um, while he was not formally excommunicated by the Greek Orthodox Church, he was not allowed to be buried within one of the cemeteries, Orthodox cemeteries. So his body today, if you go see it, is in Iraklion overseeing the water. 
In, in the town of Iraklian, there's a Cousin Psyche's uh, Museum, and you can all go visit it. And I'm going to leave you today with one of his most well-known quotes. Then el pisa tipota, the fovame tipota, ime lefteros. I don't hope for anything. I didn't hope for anything. I don't fear anything. I am free. So this tells you a lot about Zorba. I hope you enjoyed today's lecture and I'll talk to you soon.